thank you all so much for coming today. My name is Rachel Peller. I'm with Wisconsin Partners. We are essentially a coalition of multi-sector coalition of statewide associations and regional groups um, committed to positive change in the state through what's called a broad-based relational model. So we start with the relationships and then identify issues from there to work on together. Um, and so we're doing a mini replication of that through this conversation series. So literally wrote names on paper and pulled them out of a hat. Um, and Carrie and Stephanie were randomly paired. They were given uh, a few minutes to come up with a topic and immediately they said, let's do it and talk about COVID vaccine equity because it's something that they both happen to be working a lot on. Um, so the structure for today is that uh, they have anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes. They have some presentation slides that they'll kind of walk through um, to introduce the topic, provide some information and context. Um, as Stephanie was just saying a couple minutes ago, they're not necessarily like experts and don't know everything, but they're trying to bring to the surface what they know so far and what they're seeing. And um, I think everyone here has something to contribute. So um, after they talk, we will go back into the same breakout rooms that you started in, and then everyone will have a little bit of a chance to uh, respond to some uh, conversation prompts. And then we will come back as a large group so that we can all keep talking from there. This section is getting recorded. Um, so the intro through Stephanie and Carrie's uh, presentation will be recorded and then we'll stop at that point. Um, so afterwards, I do encourage you to uh, say what you want um, and be pretty open and free around that. Um, just some pretty core guidelines, uh, share the air, think about how much you're speaking, give everyone a chance to talk. Um, and then if we can consider just what said, what is said here stays here and what's learned here leaves. So if someone shares something personal, don't repeat that. But if we have a great conversation about a strategy or solution, like please use that information moving forward. Um, afterwards, I would like to send out everyone's contact information. So if you hear somebody make a really great comment or you have a great conversation with them, we would love for you to follow up. If you are not willing to share that information out with folks, please let me know. Um, all right, Whew. I think that's all the intro stuff before we like get to the fun conversation. So Stephanie and Carrie, uh, you two can take it from here. All right, Carrie, do you wanna kick us off? Absolutely. Um, Stephanie and I both work in a world where these terms get bandied about a lot. And I'm grateful to Stephanie for putting together this slide. Um, if you are not familiar with these terms or you haven't used them in a while, here's a great refresher. Um, inequality versus equality. Unequal access to opportunities and resources versus even distribution and we have the giving tree to remind us of what this looks like. And then equity and justice on the bottom part of the slide. Equity looks like custom tools that address inequality so that results are equal. Justice looks like fixing the system to offer equal access to tools and opportunities. And as we talk through what we have to share today, You'll see all of these at play. Stephanie, did you have anything you wanted to add to this? No, I think that captures it perfectly. Okay. All right. So I have been spending a lot of time with some of you on the call, in fact, about um, talking about the different ways we could look at equity. And one cut of that would be looking at geographic equity. And so I pulled some data from the DHS website on Monday and um, just looked at how many people, um, how, how equity was looking across different counties. And the range right now is 11% of Taylor County's population has been vaccinated compared to 33.8% of the Menominee County's uh, population has been vaccinated. Uh, the lowest four counties by percent right now are Taylor, Clark, Rusk, and Marathon. And the counties with the largest doses needed to get to the statewide average are Marathon, Milwaukee, Outagamie, and Racine. Those are highlighted on the right. The 
the top four by percentage are Menominee, Bayfield, Iron, and Ashland. And so even just looking at this at, by way of saying, you know, there's some geographic variances in the state um, that it would be great to better understand why and, and better like think strat strategically about how we close those gaps um, would be really important as we think about geographic equity. Stephanie, there are a couple of factors that came to light on geographic equity in my conversations with religious leaders around the state. Um, one of them has to do with the politicization of COVID and COVID responses. Um, and one of the bishops I work with pointed out that Rusk and Taylor are among the most politically conservative counties in the state um, and wondered if that has anything to do with vaccine uptake in those two counties. Um, and then something else that's come to light is in those counties where there's access to vaccine by the purchase pools through Mayo and um, the Marshfield Clinic, there is a lot more access to doses and people in those areas typically have not had trouble getting access to a vaccination appointment. Great. Yeah, it's interesting when we start to look at the data, then that gives us an opportunity to sort of um, tease apart what we think is going on and why. Um, and I think there's a huge opportunity for us to learn from other places. Um, if other places are figuring it out and doing it well, um, that would be really great to know. Uh, just um, as a point of reference, um, Richland County was one of the top four two weeks ago, um, just slipped out of the top four this time. Um, but I know that they were very, very assertive in getting themselves registered as vaccinators, getting a whole uh, community collaboration around um, structures and systems. So there may be some opportunity yet on this call to think about like how we could learn from each other in terms of closing those gaps. So as we've been um, working with the state, we also recognize that you know, part of how we get to equity is really looking at how we allocate vaccine. Um, and so uh, we know that the state is, is using the CDC Social Vulnerability Index, um, which is a way of sort of um, mapping uh, these factors, including socioeconomic factors, household composition and disability factors, minority status and language factors, as well as housing type and transportation as a way to really target vaccine to particular communities. Um, and as of, I think it was late January, DHS has been full, fully filling vaccine orders from community health centers, tribal health centers, and free clinics as an additional tool to address social vulnerability. Any thoughts there, Carrie? One of the things I always wish got included on in social vulnerability is access to the internet because so much of this is mediated through information you can get and access to vaccine appointments. And if you have difficulty accessing the internet or navigating it because of so many of these intertwined factors, it's going to affect your ability to get those vaccines into arms. Sure does. That's certainly been the theme of 2020 and 2021 is the internet access is, is one of the biggest equity factors that we didn't think to calculate previously. Mm -hmm. um, so when we, I've also been trying to look at um, equity relative to the disparate impact of COVID on particular cohorts of people. And so um, when we look at the disparate impact of COVID on people who are 65 plus, um, and I'm showing a graph that uh, was updated as of uh, Monday from the DHS website. Um, you can see that starting at age 70 and above, the majority of people who have um, died of COVID fall into those age categories. Um, and the response um, has been that people in nursing homes were the first eligible for vaccine. There was a targeted effort and a set aside of vaccine. Also, people age 65 plus were prioritized for vaccines starting January 25th. And so they've been um, in, the, in the mix in terms of a prioritized population. And as of yesterday, 62.3% of all people 65 plus have been vaccinated. <clears throat> so we're on our way with that population. I think that's good news. 
In terms of age, it's been an interesting conversation in our population base at the Council of Churches uh, because there are a lot of aging clergy. It may not be a surprise that a lot of clergy skew older. Um, and there's been a concern about whether they are able to get vaccinated um, in appropriate numbers to be able to serve the communities at large. So um, a lot of them also have comor comorbidities, lots of health concerns. And the question there is, is the, the age the right metric to be looking at or is it the comorbidities? Um, so lots of conversation in clergy circles on this. There is a lot of conversations in the health circles around that as well, as it happens. <laughs> a lot of interest from our health centers and being able to move into people who have comorbid conditions who might not hit that age threshold. Um, also wanted to just share that, um, you know, as, as we looked at the DHS website and looked at some of the disparate impact of COVID-19 on Native Americans, on the right-hand side, you can see that um, bubble graph um, that shows um, Native Americans are one and a half times as likely to die of COVID-19 as, as white residents of Wisconsin. Um, the response, I think, on this um, with this group of people has been actually really successful in that um, the federal government started direct shipping, shipping vaccine to, health, uh, to tribal health centers starting mid-December. Tribal health centers have been using discretion in getting patients vaccinated, starting with age, but also including comorbidities. And Wisconsin Department of Health Services recently partnered with Gerald Ignace um, Indian Health Center in Milwaukee to get Native Americans who are living in Milwaukee vaccinated so that they didn't have to go all the way back to their home reservation to get vaccinated. Um, and as of yesterday, 12.9% um, of the Native American population has been vaccinated compared to 17.7% of the white population. So there's still a gap, but it's not as, as significant as some of the other disparities we're gonna be talking about. And I'll also mention that the top four counties with the highest vaccine percentages also happen to be those places that have larger Native American populations. So there is some correlation to where we're seeing that impact. I like seeing that proactive response that that feels appropriate in terms of a lot of the reparations conversations that are having happening in the churches um, and in society um, in terms of what do we do to make broken relationships right. We invest at significant levels in fixing problems that we've been part of creating. Right, exactly. I think what we've seen is um, this was a Facebook post from um, one of our members, Dr. Ignace was getting vaccinated in mid-December. He was one of, he was the first one in his health center to get it on the first day that the vaccine arrived. And I think the other thing that this kind of a strategy does is it shows that one, the vaccine is accessible to this population. And two, it shows that it is safe for this population. And so it was a great strategy to get right out of the gates, um, kind of proactively addressing some of that vaccine hesitancy as well. Mm -hmm. uh, when we look at the disparate impact of COVID-19 on Hispanic or Latinx populations, um, you'll see in the bubble graph on the right that um, these folks have 1.7 times greater case rates compared to white residents. There are a couple of things happening with this. Um, so 16th Street Community Health Center in Milwaukee is set to get some direct shipment of vaccine um, starting this week. Um, and their, their patient population is predominantly um, a Hispanic or Latinx population, as well as Family Health La Clinica, one of our health centers in central Wisconsin is starting to vaccinate their agricultural workers um, based on some their really successful testing program. Um, Right now, we don't have a real, really good way to, to measure the impact on this population at all. So I'm not sure if you're hearing anything from your circles, um, Carrie, on this. Um, I've been hearing a lot about um, the unintended impacts of um, local control on the availability of vaccine, but not specifically to your point here. Um, so, 
all of the the ability of folks in in suburbs and around the state um, to get the vaccine, but in other places where the supply isn't as great, um, the flexibility hasn't been applied to such an extent, um, and that's been a problem with Hispanic and Latinx folks being able to receive the vaccine when they're ready and wanting it. Sure. Yeah. And then the last one I wanted to share was just the disparate impact of COVID-19 on our Black and African-American colleagues. And um, you'll see again from the bubble graph that Blacks have 2.1 times greater hospitalization rates than whites. Um, our current eligibility strategies have not reached this population. So healthcare workers were eligible, they skew whites. Our 65 plus crowd skews whites. Um, sadly, uh, Native American, or Black life, life expectancy actually makes 65 plus a hard bar for many uh, Black communities. And the educator population has skewed white. So the response I put is TBD. We're, I'm not sure that we have a, a response yet. Um, but when we look at the impacts, 6.2% of um, Black or African-American residents have been vaccinated compared to 17.7% of white residents, which that's a, you know, that's three times as many. And so close to three times as many. So I think there's more work we need to be doing here. And I guess the only other thing I would say on this is it, it's not an abstraction for the groups that I'm working with um, that, that this disparity is here. Um, I remember talking to one of our health center members uh, in April last year, month and a half into the pandemic. And she had already been to 12 funerals for people that she knew who had died of COVID-19. And at that point, I didn't even know someone who had gotten it, let alone died of it. <clears throat> and I would hate to hate to know the answer to how many funerals she had been to at this point, but um, this, is, this is a visceral um, pain point, I think, for a lot of folks that I work with. We're hearing the same thing through the historically black churches. Uh, the, the numbers hit hard, they hit fast. Um, and the trauma and grief people are facing are significant compared to a good number of people in churches that are predominantly white that have had indirect impacts um, or much less severity of disease. It's just less of a reality to folks in churches that aren't predominantly black or aren't part of the historically black tradition. Um, we've also had conversations about vaccine uptake among pastors, and it's become this abstract ethical conversation for some pastors in the predominantly white tradition. Uh, will you get the vaccine when it's available to you? Do you feel like you need to hold off until more vulnerable groups get it? Um, or, you know, can you work from home? Do you feel like it's the right thing? And the Black pastors have said, this is not the conversation we are having in our community. I can't get it. I'm eligible and I cannot get it. And this is a problem. And it was absolutely eye-opening in a group of multi-faith clergy from all over the state to hear this. And it really motivated us to take some action. Great. Well, and that might be a really good segue into some of those actions that you've been starting to think about and talk about. Sure. So we're coming from a perspective where we're a Christian organization working in multi-faith coalitions. Um, and we're connected with folks all over the state, primarily through faith-based organizations, um, both the church and allied not-for-profits. And what we have been hearing is that a significant pain point is disparate access to information and disparate access to the registration systems for appointments for vaccine. Some of that has to do with broadband internet. If your internet speed isn't fast enough, you can't get those appointments when they come out. If you're not fluent in internet, you can't navigate the websites fast enough when those appointments drop. If you don't have time to sit on the web or sit in a pharmacy waiting for those end of day extra doses, you're stuck. If you're a person with disabilities, are those appointment sites 
good for you to navigate? Does that work out? And then we also have among our membership uh, groups that cater to justice involved individuals. And I recently was reminded some folks when they're released from prison or jail, a condition of their release is that they cannot have a smartphone or access the internet. So tell me, how are you supposed to gain access to the information you need about the availability of vaccines um, or to register for a vaccine if most of the information is coming out on the internet? We do <laughs> have phone numbers, but largely the information is being pushed out online. So the responses to these things at this point, some of them are coming from the system. Some of them are coming through interpersonal relationships and the impact of those mitigations is really varied. Some of them are helpful if you're well-connected. Um, some of them aren't necessarily reaching the folks that they're needing to reach. I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Stephanie. I am actually hearing very, very similar things in, um in our members and then just coincidentally my parents are now on the front page of the they were on the front page of the paper this last weekend as being tech challenge seniors who had to use some extraordinary measures to and some tech savvy younger people to get a vaccine and so i know this both from my family and my and my day job yep um you can go on ahead to the next slide if you'd like um what we're thinking as a council of churches is we really need to work from both directions on this. Um, it is really important, of course, that from the, from the inside out, the policy information and distribution systems are working on this justice and equity piece. But those of us who are community advocates and informed individuals who have a heart for this, work through our informal networks to push as well from the outside in there are these constant new developments. Even the best intention system is gonna have gaps in its awareness, um, its flexibility, its ability to respond. But those of us who have created tools to deal with non-responsive systems have these tools and we can apply them to address the current need. We've been talking about if you have created systems to get people to the polls, how can we adapt those to get people to vaccination appointments? If you have tools to notify people when the weather's bad and you're closing down church, how can we adapt those to share information about vaccination? If you have food pantries, how can we adapt that to get information to people who need it, to get people where they need to be when for a doctor's appointment um, that's routine, how can we adapt that for vaccines? Um, if your pastor's on the line to get six parishioners a vaccination appointment, maybe we can do that a little bit more broadly and not just have the pastor do it, but have others in the congregation do it. Ultimately, there's room for being partners in developing solutions and challenging assumptions. I think we've all got to work together. Um, Amen, sister. <laughs> I really, I mean, I really love that. And I think that um, that's where I've seen some of the most creative stuff happening is when um, the, the healthcare, you know, like my health centers are working with specific churches and their communities and, and building those partnerships and coming up with those creative ways to get the resources where they need to be just in time. Or um, when we're working with community partners who have that trusted voice, who if people are going to listen to their pastor in a much different way than they're going to listen to, you know, a talking head on TV or the radio. And so, you know, how can we really work together to, to kind of make this better? I do see a question in the chat about whether anybody's tried a phone tree and that's part of a project we're starting to develop right now through the Council of Churches is recommending some best practices to churches on what they can do to help improve vaccination rates in their communities. So many are looking forward to the day when they can gather and our recommendations to churches on gathering in person to again are built on that herd immunity rate we know we need to reach in the state. 
the best way a church can have an impact on that is through their own community and increasing their own vaccination rate. Yeah, well, we were hoping to just kind of start the conversation just with our to chat back and forth. And hopefully this prompted some thinking and ideas from you all. Um, I found this cartoon online just randomly. It was almost pushed to me on my Facebook feed. Um, and I, it's not relative to COVID vaccine for sure, but it, it, I thought it was pertinent here. Like if we wait for the government, it's gonna be too late. If we act as individuals, it will be too little. But if we act at communities, it might just be enough. And so I'm going to stop sharing here and turn it over to Rachel, who can maybe kick off some discussion. Hey, how did you get Greg Nitz on video? This has never happened before. Hey, I want to just... I wanted to showcase my grandfatherly skills. See up there, the kids are coming and that's gonna be a pilot, pirate balloon drop for them. 